So this is meant to be a two-part panel with Southwestern University, uh, it's their philosophy club, um, about the election, which is in a week. We did that on purpose. We did a Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday thing. So the, in two weeks from today, we'll come back and we'll do a follow-up. Um, <clears throat> I, I do want to get us down with a prediction just because uh, political scientists are really bad at this. And it, I think since we're both political scientists, it'd be fun to, to humiliate us in two weeks. <laughs> um, and then, especially, but that's gotten really worse in the last few years. It's become even harder and harder for us to nail things down. I think what we'll do is we'll do a, maybe a 10, 20 minute intro, like just sort of place where we are, and then just open it up to Q&A, and so it'll be more of a discussion and less of a, a lecture kind of format, and then see where it goes. Um, do you want to start or do you want me to start? Go for it. You want me to start? Yeah. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> I, some, this is going to be redundant for some of you because I've been spending so much time talking about elections, but um, I, I think the place to start is just sort of where we are in the world, like where we are in sort of the, the, the big picture. And it seems that we're in this trend that's been going on globally since probably around 2009, where the world is de-democratizing and flying wildly to the right. Um, Hungary kind of paved the way at, at some level. Um, Poland has jumped on board. Austria just had an election that flipped them wildly to the right. And then, of course, uh, Brazil has just gone to the right. The United States election in 2016 pulled us wildly to the right. And then on top of that, Brexit was definitely a reactionary event, um, fueled by reactionary politicians in Britain who cynically used Brexit to get themselves reelected, but without the intention of Britain actually Brexiting. So when David Cameron got the Brexit vote on, and then they Brexited, it, because it was a publicity stunt, um, he was forced to resign. So the irony of ironies was that the guy who wanted the vote didn't want it to actually be a yes vote, and then his career blew up. Um, and I think that's part of where we are in, in the world right now, is everything has become cynical and manipulative, and it's all about getting you to vote for them. It has nothing to do with substance. In the past, substance played a very small role, but there, there maybe was an ingredient of substance whereas now it's all hyperbole and hype, and there's essentially no substance. And of course, that's exemplified by the president's statements about the, the caravan coming up. You know, he, he has yet to say something that's accurate about the caravan. The perspective about who the people are in the caravan has been hyped up. Um, this is not our first caravan. They are immigrants. Their goal is to come here because their, their lives suck. It is not because they're in some kind of democratic conspiracy to destroy America. But he can say these things, and he gets away with them. Um, you know, just today he said that he's going to change the, the Constitution with an executive order so that you, being born in the United States doesn't confer citizenship on you. This is, of course, preposterous, because to do a constitutional amendment, you have to do a constitutional amendment. You can't do an executive order. But, right, he knows, and he probably doesn't know, but the people around him know. <laughs> I mean, it, it seems clear to me that this guy doesn't understand anything. Um, but the people around him are probably smart enough to know, oh my God, that, that doesn't work. That's not how it works, Mr. President. He doesn't care. They don't care because it's going to get his voters out, right? And so at the end of the day, it, it's, it is kind of a hollow promise, but they don't seem to mind. Uh, he's sitting on 42% approval, which is both surprisingly high and surprisingly low at the exact same time. We have 3.9% unemployment, and he's at 42% approval. That's bewildering. Um, at this point in Obama's presidency, Obama was sitting on 45% approval, but he had 10% unemployment. So you know, uh, when you when you when you look at those things that we used to, as political scientists, look to to try to figure out where a president's approval ratings are, Trump should have really high approval right now. Having said that, um, you know, except for getting tax cuts for the rich and some crazy hyperbole and destroying all our alliances and almost getting, in, getting us into a world war, uh, Trump hasn't really achieved anything substantial. And, and you would think that the American voters would be turning on him, and they're not. His 42% is not technically his high point, but it's the highest it's been since February or March of 2017, because he, he got a little bit of inauguration bump, and then he crashed. 
And uh, he fell all the way down to 36% in summer of 2017. Um, he didn't get back into the 40s until December of last year. And, but now, since then, he's been flatlined. So it's really interesting to see that happening. On the other hand, a, a, apparently, Americans are really upset at some level. So he's got 42% approval, but he's got 55% disapproval. And that 55% seems to be indicating that they want to vote against the president in the midterms. So every midterm election since 1902, with the exception of 1998 and 2002, has resulted in the president's party losing seats in both houses of Congress. So that's not unusual. That's normal American politics. Um, the question is, it was, is this going to be a drubbing, a real beating, or is this just going to be sort of a few seats get lost? It can't be a, a, a complete thorough beating unless there's really high voter turnout because the House is so gerrymandered that in 2016, only 4% of the seats were actually up for grabs. Um, this election, it's, it's, it's more than doubled. It's 9% of the seats are up for grabs. But you've got to remember, a nine, uh, it's actually 40, 40, I'm sorry, it's, a, it's 35 seats. Because the Democrats have 199 safe seats and the Republicans have 201 safe seats. So there's only 35 seats up for grab. So this is supposed to be a blue wave where the Democrats come in and sweep. The absolute most they could do is end up with 234. Because the other 400 seats, the outcome is essentially already settled. Um, the other end of the, the equation, of course, is the Senate. The Senate could conceivably flip, but the odds are stacked against that happening because most of the seats that are up for grabs are Democratic seats, and the, the swing seats, right, are mostly Democratic seats. Uh, Texas is now officially up for grabs, but it wasn't until recently. Um, and, you know, honestly and realistically, it, I, I think the odds are still stacked against Beto. There's a week left of voting, but uh, he, it's a, he's still behind, right? The polls are showing... I think the latest poll shows him 4% behind, which is technically within the margin of error, but the margin of error was 4%. So it's right on the cusp. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I, I don't know. Uh, I wouldn't bet a lot of money on Beto winning. Um, if Beto did win, however, it would make the Senate something that was, was attainable for the Democrats. I think that Texas really is kind of the swing on whether that happens or not. Um, it's worth pointing out that the generic poll for Congress right now has the Democrats about 7.7% with a 7.7% lead. In 2006, the generic poll for Congress had the Democrats, or well, the generic result was that the Democrats won by eight percentage points for Congress. Um, in 2006, they captured both the House and the Senate. So 7.7 .7 is definitely in the ballpark, but the makeup was a little bit different. There were more seats that were up for grabs in the House, and then in the Senate, it was more evenly distributed so that the Democrats had more opportunities to take Republican seats away. So 7.7 .7 isn't probably enough to have that kind of 2006 sweep. Um, in 2008, when Obama was elected, the Democrats were ahead by 12 points, and that's where they got the filibuster-proof uh, Senate. Uh, that is actually, a, was, I should say, a, a possibility. In December of last year, the Democrats in the generic polls for Congress were polling at 13.0%, which was one percentage point higher than um, the, the, the Obama result in 2008. But that, that margin has been eroding pretty consistently until maybe the last few months, and then it's slowly been going back up. Um, and it started not with the tax cuts, right? Uh, Trump would have you believe that the tax cuts did it. By the time the tax cuts had their effect on polling, his, the generic congressional lead that the Democrats had went from 13 to 12.2. Uh, so it did shift almost 1%. What really happened was Trump made his shitholes country comment where he talked about Africa and El Salvador and Haiti and lump them together as, why are these people coming from shithole countries? Why can't they come from cool places like Norway? And that dramatically caused the Democrats to lose uh, their, in their generic congressional lead. Uh, it fell to, uh, I, want, I think it was the lowest 5.5% from 13%. From 
and then it's slowly been working its way back up. So uh, I, I fully expect the president to come out with something over the top racist. I, I feel like his caravan thing was kind of hinting in that direction, right? These people are, are violent rapists and drug dealers. But then uh, on the other hand, um, his, you know, we're going to take away citizenship w w also hinted in that direction. But it wasn't the, the, the meat of, you know, like these people are all race, rapists and murderers, like how he launched his campaign. And it wasn't the, the really important stuff like where he's calling countries shithole countries. Um, having said all of this, I, I don't think this selection is that important. <laughs> right? So it's important, but I don't think it's that important. I think what's really important are the state races in 2020. Because every 10 years we do the census and every 20, 10 years as a result we redistrict. In Texas we like to redistrict three times after every census, but that's because we're insane. Um, and that's a different problem. Um, and, but normally you're supposed to district once. And so whoever gets elected in 2020 is the, the population of people who are going to redistrict for the next 10 years for the United States. And so whatever happens in one week from today, I think it's really important that people kind of remember that. So if, if you, know, you were really hoping Beto was going to win and he doesn't win, I think you need to re remain focused on the reality, which is that, OK, but then there's 2020. And 2020 is the one that really matters. I actually think 2020 will, will effectively be the most important election of our lifetime, M mine, yours, um, because so much is at stake. The gerrymandering in the United States has gotten to the point where it's obscene, and we have all these safe districts. So we know the results of 91% of the elections. That's, that's the definition of a rigged election. Like at that point, we're, we're like a third world tyranny that just goes through the rhythm of having elections. But we already know who's going to win, so it doesn't really matter. Well, why even bother at that point? I actually think we should lose our status. Uh, the Economist is now rating countries on their, by their by by how democratic they are. And we're a deeply troubled marginal democracy at this point. I, I actually think we should lose that. I think we should, we should officially be switched over to hybrid, which is where you're no longer officially a democracy. Um, and, and I think we should have lost it last election when we were at 96% uh, safe seats in the House. Um, so, so having said all that, I think there's another component. And the Democrats have been struggling with this. And I'm going to let you talk about this a little bit more. But that is how to get its base, which is, you know, it, there is a huge white population that votes Democrat, but its real, real base is people of color, women, and then young people. And then how to get them to vote. Women vote, African Americans vote, um, Hispanics, Asians, and young people don't. So, you know, like in the midterm, the last midterm, uh, 18 to 29 year olds had a 16% voter turnout rate. Whereas 60-year-olds uh, and up were voting at 55%. Uh, so that, that's, that's a pretty dramatic difference. I, I saw like an exit, exit poll thing that showed that that age group that's 18 to 29 might be at 21% at this point with the early voting. That's an exciting improvement, but it's not enough, right? If you really were going to do this right, it should be 81%. And so one of the questions I think that we have to ask ourselves going forward, no matter what happens this election, is what does it take? Like, our, you know, um, the UN has just put out a report. We've got 12 years to stop the Earth from overheating more than 1.5 degrees Celsius. We're going to lose two years because, right, there's no way to do anything until 2020 anyway. Um, so we're, we've got 10 years left. And there's a possibility that we're already probably too late, especially with the permafrost and the rate that permafrost is melting. But we, we, the question now is, there's going to be damage. The question is, is it going to be 1.5 degrees or is it going to be 3.3 degrees? The question is, are we going to have to have category 7 for our hurricanes or are we going to keep it at category 5 and we're just going to have a bunch of category 5s? And I, and I think that... That sh alone should be enough to motivate people to go, but apparently it isn't. And so I'm a, I'm a little bewildered and a little baffled about what, what it takes. Um, uh, do we need to do a draft, maybe? Just everybody, no gender, no college exemption, everybody goes. Maybe, maybe that would motivate people. I'm ready. I'm ready to, to vote for a draft. 100% everybody has to do it. <laughs> I bet the number of wars we fought would plunge. 
Like it was just poof. Anyway, um, so, I, so I, I think that's also another thing that Democrats have to figure out. And maybe this election is that. Um, Trump won Texas by nine points, but it's worth pointing out that Greg Abbott beat Wendy Davis by 20 points. So if, it, if, it, if 2014 was 20 and then 2016 was nine, and then Beto loses by four, you know, that seems like that's heading in the right direction. That, that, looks, like, that looks like progress, uh, even if it's slow. And I actually, I, I, I want to stop my opening marks, remarks and hand it over to you. Oh, okay. Cool. Are you, oh, could you, you know, yeah. I, don't, I never introduce myself because I just assume you know who I am, <laughs> but I think you need to introduce Yeah, me. hi. So I'm Christy Kelly. I am also a government professor here at ACC. I got my PhD at UT, uh, and I studied youth voting behavior. So I studied a lot of you guys. Um, so yeah, my, my specialty really lies in voting behavior, turnout, vote choice, stuff like that. And so Roy was asking, you know, what is it going to take? to get people to show up to the polls. You know, if we had an answer to that, <laughs> it would solve a lot of problems in our democracy. Uh, but let me tell you where we stand on young voters, 18 to 29 year olds. Um, one of the uh, you know, most striking things I, I found in my research was that while young people care and young people do hold uh, preferences as to who's elected, it's still really hard to actually get you to the polls. Uh, you know, Roy mentioned 21% uh, of young voters are turning out uh, in early voting. That's actually a really good number. If we hit the 20% mark for young voters in a midterm election, that's a good year. But just to put this into perspective, um, even in our high turnout years for presidential elections, youth voting rarely breaks the 40% mark. And you know, that 40% turnout mark is what it, would, what it would essentially take for Beto to win, right? And I just, it's not that I don't have faith in young people, but um, just historically, uh, what we've found is that young people are very reactionary, right? They only really receive the loudest shouts from the political world. And most of the time, what motivates young people to the polls are when, you know, issues that the, government's, that the government is facing directly affect them. So 2008 was the highest turnout among young voters, you know, since the voting age dropped in 1972 to, from 21 to 18. Um, and what was motivating young people to the polls were the worst recession since the Great Depression, extremely high unemployment levels among young people. And on top of that, you had the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, which were, you know, disproportionately affecting young people, their friends, right? Because who, who joins the military, right? They tend to be younger people. So most young people knew somebody or they themselves um, had been, you know, deployed uh, during this war. And what really motivated young people to the polls was the fact that these were issues that directly touched them. 2018, I'm not sure what issues would be the catalyst to get young people to the polls, right? School shootings, yeah, maybe, you know, but other than that, I mean, there's not a whole lot except for this disgust of our current political system. But emotional uh, rhetoric scholars, scholars who study emotions and how it affects politics, have found that disgust is actually some, is an emotion that turns people away from voting, right? If you're angry, if you are um, anxious about government and politics, you're more likely to participate. But if you're disgusted with politics, you're less likely to participate. So at this point, you know, I'm not really sure. So let's talk about the Senate race, right? Beto versus Ted Cruz. You know, a year ago, Beto had no shot in the respect that he had no name recognition. A, a Ted Cruz is a nationally known name. Beto, even as of June, a quarter of Texans had no idea who he was. Now, given his unprecedented campaign fundraising, right? He's outraised Ted Cruz three to one. Beto has been pouring that money into buying that name recognition. That is why his campaign has had as many, you know, yard signs available as, you know, money can buy. Most campaigns run out of campaign signs and bumper stickers pretty early on in the campaign. 
Beto's campaign is like, we have more money than we know what to do with. So let's buy these campaign you know, bumper stickers, these yard signs, and make sure that people at least recognize this name. That is the only reason why he's polling within four points of Ted Cruz. So what would it take for him to actually win? Well, if you look at most of these polls, these polls will poll likely voters. People who are consistent voters who turn out in the midterms, in the primaries, in the general elections. What it would take for Beto to win is high turnout among unlikely voters, right? A among young people, among Latinos in our state. You know, Latinos are referred to as the sleeping giant in American politics because the number of eligible Latino voters is growing, I mean, in huge numbers. We're talking about millions of people every year, millions of Latinos becoming eligible to vote. But their turnout levels at both presidential and midterm elections is much lower than uh, whites and African Americans. So what we would need would be for young people to show up in unprecedented numbers and Latinos to show up in unprecedented numbers. Okay? Um, and then he has a shot. And is it doable? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the reason why Donald Trump in 2016 won states like Wisconsin, which was the other one? Was it Michigan or Minnesota? Michigan. It was Michigan, yeah. Um, and Pennsylvania. Right, right. But especially Wisconsin and Michigan, both, of, both states which often lean Democrat, was because Hillary was, was she didn't campaign in those states. They, she just assumed that her base was gonna show up. But what happens? Her base does not turn out as at high, at, at, as high levels as expected. And some of these unlikely voters came out and supported Trump, right? These two states went red because unlikely voters actually showed up. So is it possible? Yes. Is it likely? Like Roy, I'm not gonna put my money on Beto winning this race. That wasn't, my, that wasn't 10 minutes, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can talk a lot more about voting behavior and all that kind of stuff. We can make some predictions, yeah. Okay, you ready for your prediction? Uh, sure, how, what are we predicting? Uh, how about who, who wins the Senate? Who wins the Senate, like we'll start there. key races in the Senate? Oh, or? I was just thinking generic, but also maybe Beto. Yeah, so uh, Republicans, I think, keep the Senate. Um, you know, again, most of the Senate seats that are up for re-election this year are being held by Democrats. So really, it's the Democrats who are more likely to be the big losers here. So I think that Democrats have the potential to win the Senate seat in Nevada, right? Dean Heller um, sort of squeaked out a win in 2012, and Nevada went blue in 2016, okay? So... Uh, Dean Heller, I think, was sort of on shaky footing to begin with, and even though he's the incumbent and incumbents have a, a significant advantage, uh, that's his, his race to lose. But on the Democratic side, Heidi Heitkamp, North Dakota, is, I mean, trailing her Republican opponent big time, right? And uh, North Dakota went to Trump in 2016, so I think she loses her seat. Uh, of the other... Um, Democrats in trouble, uh, West Virginia, Joe Manchin. I think his vote to support uh, Kavanaugh, right, his, his yes vote on Kavanaugh's nomination may have um, helped him. I think it may have helped secure that seat. Um, but even, you know, Missouri, Claire McCaskill has the potential to lose. Oh, but just this morning I read that uh, the Arizona Senate seat uh, that Jeff Flake is vacating. Uh, Kristen Sinema, uh, earlier this year, she's the Democrat, she was actually polling behind Martha McSally for these early polls, and very recent polls, I'm just talking about within the last two months, have put her ahead, still within the margin of error, but right, Arizona might be another one um, that Democrats can pick up. But yeah, I, I think Republicans hold on to the Senate. For the House, I think it's gonna be close. Right? I, I think you're right that there's about um, 30, 35 seats that are true toss-ups. Um, and yeah, gerrymandering matters. But let me backtrack a little bit. So incumbents who run have about a 90, 95% chance of being reelected. 
you had a bunch of Republicans in the House who knew that their reelection prospects were in trouble, and they just retired, right? Something like, what, 23 of them straight up retired, and then a bunch more. So, you know, the Democrats in many of these states are not facing an incumbent. So I do think that they pick up more House seats, but yeah, with, with Trump's approval le levels going up, I think it's gonna be really tight, right? Democrats need to pick up, how many is it, like 23 seats or something? I think, well, if you, if you accept that there's 199 that are mm -hmm. safe, they yeah. have to win 19. 19, okay, of, yeah, of the 35, seats. assuming that 35 are right. really toss up. Yeah. Is it possible? Yes, I think it's gonna be close. I think it's gonna be real close. I yeah. think that there's a couple of California seats that Democrats are gonna pick up, right? Daryl Ease's um, uh, Southern California, uh, Orange County seat, that is going to go blue. I think there's one other California House seat that's gonna go blue as well, but yeah, I mean, there's a couple of blue seats currently being held in Minnesota that I think are also gonna go red, so. Right. Yeah, it's gonna be close. It's gonna be close. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think my, my prediction level is pretty much like yours. So the Senate will remain Republican in the House, It'll be a narrow, narrow margin if the Democrats pick it up. Yeah. Um, I, having said that, I, I've been thinking about this other thing, which is what if the Democrats don't win the House and they don't win the Senate? And then I think that Trump will interpret that as a mandate and he'll go, he'll go full force forward with all his programs. Mm -hmm. So I think it's okay for the Democrats not to win the Senate. I think it would be a catastrophe if the Democrats don't win the House. Yeah. Now, to sort of piggyback, though, when you were saying that 2020 is like a big, important year. So turnout rises in presidential election years, and a lot of that is due to increased Democratic voting. So a lot of the people who drop off in the midterms are Democrats. Republicans are just more consistent voters, and a lot of this has to do with, you know, demographics, you know, age, uh, education, and income are like the three biggest predictors of turnout. And Republicans sort of have that advantage. Um, so they're very consistent voters. Democrats, though, are more fickle. Democrats love to surge uh, in turnout in presidential election years, and it declines in midterm election years. So, you know, the hope is, uh, at least for the Democrats, is that you have a strong enough presidential candidate to really bring out Democrats that year, and that you have sort of these uh, down ballot you know, state level, state, state legislative races, uh, and, and their Democratic candidates in these races sort of ride on the coattails of the presidential candidate. That is how the Democrats can win back majorities in state legislatures. And of course, it's the state legislatures who are charged with redistricting, right? Redrawing those district maps. So, right? Silver yeah. lining? Silver lining? <laughs> yeah, and that, that's also probably one of the things that hurt the Democrats in 2010 is it was a midterm election year. So they get slaughtered at the state level because Democrats don't vote in midterms. Mm -hmm. um, it's also worth pointing out that Democrats are, people who identify as Democrat in the United States right now is 31%. People who identify as Republican is 24%. So it means that there's, there's 1.3 Democrats for every Republican. And yet, you know, we're talking about whether or not the Democrats can win. And it's because Democrats don't vote and Republicans are very consistent at, at voting. Well, and, and you know, I mean, at those numbers, I think you're not including, you know, closet partisans. That's true. Right? I mean, so there's this, like, myth of the independent voter. There's, you know, 40% of Americans today say, I am not affiliated with a political party, right? I am an independent. But when you ask them, do you tend to vote for Democratic candidates or tend to vote for Republican candidates? Um, most, tr you know, most in independents are actually leaners they actually behave like partisans at the polls, right? And think about this, you know, think about yourselves, if, if you identify as an independent, right? Do you tend to split your ticket or do you tend to heavily prefer one party's candidate, right? So there's an estimate that there might only be about, you know, 10 to 15% of a true independents who are actually independent. And everybody else, right, the other 30, you know, 25, 30% are actually leaners. And a lot of those leaners, are young people, right? So that is another thing that might sort of help the Democrats, um, especially, you know, moving forward is that, they, uh, you know, these can campaigns keep saying, oh, well, these independents are so, so toss-up. I'm like, no, no, really. A lot of them are just closet partisans. They just don't know that they're Democrats or Republicans yet.
Which also brings up another issue, which is that Americans are terrible at, at identifying their own ideologies. Um, we've done some interesting surveys. And <laughs> we'll ask a person to identify yourself, they'll pick their ideology, and then we'll ask them questions, and they will be shockingly inconsistent with what they originally said, mm -hmm. which is probably also another problem that Democrats suffer from. Yeah, oh man. Uh, all right, so I, I want to open it up to Q&A. Uh, if you guys want to jump in. You look so forlorn, like I, <laughs> like I killed your cat or something. Let's do this. <laughs> uh, did everybody get the first part, or do you want me to restart? Yeah, just, just ask Okay, question. so at, if something does happen, which I really hope it doesn't, mm -hmm. like if some violence happens, do you think that'll be the big enough shout? I'm not sure. I mean, if it, if it actually happens, the question is how, how much are young people going to be paying attention to that? Right, and I'm not sure. I mean, you guys are college students. You're, you know, most of you are in you know, government classes right now. You're getting political input that people who aren't in college are not receiving, right? So you guys are more politically aware, you're, you're more abreast with current events, right? But the 18 to 29 demographic that are high school graduates only or less than high school graduates, yeah, I'm not sure that that's gonna be politically impactful enough. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's also another factor that's interesting about your question, which is, so Trump is trying to get his base to come out and vote. I actually think Republicans are already motivated. I don't think he needs to get his base to come out and vote. I think it's the Democrats that need their base to come out and vote. So one of the weird things about Trump trying to get his base out is in the process he might actually get the Democrats to vote in larger numbers. That was one of the things that kept coming up with Kavanaugh was will this motivate Republicans or will this motivate Democrats? And my thinking is, it, you know, the Republicans are already motivated, so this can only help Democrats. Right. Yeah, and the, uh, Republican enthusiasm, especially in Texas, has actually gone up in the last couple of months too. So that's something else that really hurts Beto's chances of winning. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Other questions? You, you have to ask other questions or we can't leave. I have a mic, but anybody else want it? Go for it. I'll think of one. I'll sit here yeah. and think. What is the character? Oh, wait. Yeah. She has the mic. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, no, well, she has the mic. Would Beto <laughs> losing the election be more beneficial or harmful for him in terms of you saying that 2020? is the m most important election. <laughs> well, uh, here's the thing. Okay, so Beto is a national name now. I mean, the fact that the nation's even watching this Texas Senate race is fairly unprecedented. I mean, nobody pays attention to Texas Senate races because Democrats just get decimated. So now that he has a national name, does this set him up? I, you know, is, is the question more like, does this set him up good politically for his future? Mm -hmm. Probably, right? I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, maybe not 2020, but it's, he certainly could maybe throw in his name, throw, in, throw his name in the hat for president in 2020. Possible? Unlikely, but you never know. With, uh, Democrats are really sorely lacking in good young candidates. I mean, everybody that the, that the uh, Democrats are looking at, I mean, Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Hillary Warren, Clinton. Hillary Clinton. I mean, give me somebody under the age of 60, please, <laughs> right? So, um, yeah, I mean, the Democrats just don't have as many young and vibrant um, potential candidates, with the exceptions of maybe, you know, like, Cory Booker, uh, you know, the senator from New Jersey, or Kamala Harris, even uh, senator from California. But yeah, they're not a whole lot. So may maybe this, this is Beto's time to shine, and really, it, maybe this sets him up for a future presidential run, yeah. yeah. I can totally see this setting him up, especially because his, his war chest is so huge. Oh, uh, I think it's 37 million, something ridiculous like that. Oh, I think it's even bigger than Is that Is it even now? bigger yeah. than that? So, yeah, yeah and, I, and I keep getting emails, so I know that he, the people are still campaign fun, financing him. Um, and he's not spending at all, right? So there's going to be a really large 
war chest at the end of next Tuesday that the guy is going to be sitting on top of. So between name recognition and funding, there, there is something there. 2020, I, I'm having a hard time imagining a Democrat even running in 2020. Like, I don't even know what that looks like at this point. And it's just two years away, so you know that come, come December, people are going to start announcing. Um, so one of the interesting things about that, though, is if Beto runs and he does, so he, he got name recognition, he runs in 2020, he doesn't get anywhere, it's all it's going to do is enhance his name recognition. So if, so if he's playing the long game, he is definitely setting himself up with this race, whether he wins or loses. He did say if, I, if he does win, and you know, I still think there's a possibility he could. Like, I think if you guys threaten to kill your neighbor's cats and stuff, you could maybe get them to go vote. Um, <laughs> And I, I encourage you to do that. Um, no, please don't kill your neighbor's cat. Well, no, threaten, <laughs> threaten. I didn't actually say do it. Anyway, so um, just, just threaten. Uh, anyway, if, if Beto wins, he did say he's going to serve out his whole term. Now, but having said that, we've had politicians say they're going to serve out their whole term, and then they don't. Um, so, you know, who knows how that, how that actually ends up looking. Um, Although I suspect if he won, he would wait until 2024. I think it would be totally really advantageous to do so, unless a Democrat wins in 2020 and then his year is 2028. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. unless, unless, well, unless it's one of the geriatrics who, who's around when Lincoln was around, who, you know, when, when Bernie Sanders talks about civil rights, he meant 1860s, <laughs> not 1960s. Uh, and so, it, you know, it is entirely possible that he could run in 2024. Yeah. Yeah. You had a question? Can you pass the mic? Will you just like explain what the caravan thing is you were just talking about? I don't know what that is. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is not the first. Um, what happened was Central Americans who were wanting to immigrate to the United States began doing these caravans to avoid having to deal with gangs. Is that me banging? Am I the one banging? I feel like somebody's no, banging. Oh, okay. Um, I just want to make sure it wasn't me. So anyway, what happened was uh, people began joining these caravans because the thinking was you could, you could avoid dealing with gangs. There, you could avoid dealing with corrupt police. Uh, there were kidnappings that were going on. There were murders going on. So this was a way to create safety as you migrated north. Some of these people aren't actually trying to get to the United States. They're trying to get to Mexico. Because, as, you know, I think our assumption is Mexico's not a very good economy. It's huge. It's a growing, massive economy with a lot of wealth in it. And it, especially when you contrast it to Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, where there, there, there isn't much development going on. What happened during Obama's administration was um, to try to get the number of people immigrating from Central America down, we began giving Central America hundreds of millions of dollars in aid packages that were designed to stimulate the economy and, and incentivize people staying. One of the problems with that, of course, has been corruption, and a lot of that money hasn't ended up exactly where it was supposed to. And so as a result, the, the kind of economic stimulus that we had expected didn't happen. Also, on top of that, um, the, the levels of violence in those three Central American states has gone through the roof. One of the reasons is because the United States frequently will incarcerate a person who's uh, an undocumented immigrant. They'll join a gang while incarcerated, and then we'll deport them after we release them from prison, and then they take the gang back to Central America. So we've, we've created these nasty American-style gangs in Central America through our, our brutal prison system and our, and our brutal deportation system. Um, the, that caravan, the, the first one, the 6,000 people one that Trump spent so much energy on, I, I think was it 2,000 of them, 1,700, it was a number like that, actually asked for uh, Mexico to take them in. They, they weren't even coming to the United States. Um, and then, of course, Trump said, we, don't, we think there, there are people from MS-13 and Middle Easterns in the, in the you know, really, Middle Easterns? Anyway, um, so, you know, there's this, there's this question <laughs> of could it be possible that Middle Easterners are flying to Central America and joining this caravan, and it, it really makes me laugh. That's 
years. Oh, and did you hear the latest that they're bringing diseases with them? Oh, too? wow. Like this, po there's like a new polio like disease that has been spreading, you know, if very few people, very few kids, but like it, it, it we, we just um, had two reported cases here in Travis County and one in Williamson County, and there's some Republican um, legislators who are saying, oh, well, maybe this is being brought in through the caravan. I'm like, what are you talking about? What? So, yeah. And, and then also, just for the record, the last caravan, when it did arrive at the border, uh, ICE refused to actually process them initially, but eventually did process them. Um, and you know, the, we, the, the, Trump keeps talking about we need to vet people. We totally vet people at the border. We check to make sure, we interview them multiple times to make sure they're really refugees. We try to figure out what their motives are. Do they have family here? We, like all of that is, we process that. It, it, the border is not an open border. We don't have that. And so this, this whole thing of we have to secure the border by sending soldiers to the border is really quite absurd. Um, it, it, is, it is a publicity stunt designed to get a certain type of person to the poll. Uh, so I wanted to jump back to actually something that you had said earlier in terms of, uh, you know, for the presidential elections, it's something that Democrats will typically kind of ride the coattails on. Um, and it seems like another kind of uh, strategy there is also some of the like social movements like the legalization of marijuana same-sex marriage seems to like the regulators out too uh, and so my question is uh, for Texas specifically uh, like what maybe proposition that's on the ballot or just like potential piece of piece of legislation would be most beneficial to young voters and what should we be the most concerned about I mean when you said legalization of marijuana I think that's a big one that brings young people to the polls. Um, and even, you know, <laughs> recreationally aside, it's a windfall for Texas, right? If Texas legalizes it and taxes the crap out of it, I mean, talk about a benefit to the education system. You know, when Colorado uh, legalized marijuana back in 2013, they had a $78 billion surplus or something. Uh, it was so much money. And, and so they put it to the voters. They said, hey, do you guys want a massive tax refund? Or should we just put this all? Did I say billion? I should say million. I think that's more accurate. But they were like, do you want us to uh, give this money back to you in a tax refund? Or do you want us to put this towards public education? And Colorado voters, are like 70% of them said, let's improve our public education system. Right, and that is something that we sorely need in the state of Texas. So, um, you know, that's a big one, I think, that brings uh, young people out. Um, one thing that I, th I think that young people need to be afraid of is there's, there's this talk about getting, uh, basically what the Republicans uh, in Congress are doing right now is they're dismantling Obamacare piece by piece, right? So they've already gotten rid of the individual mandate. That basically has, it's like a piece of Jenga, right? That is the one critical piece in Jenga that if you pull out, everything else crumbles. Um, without an individual mandate, you cannot protect pre-existing conditions. Why? Because what people are going to do is they're not going to have insurance. Oh, suddenly I find out I have cancer. Well, because they cannot deny me because of pre-existing uh, pre conditions, well, now I'm going to jump back onto the insurance market, pay whatever fine you know, the Republicans have come up with. Um, but now you've become more expensive to treat, right? That's not how insurance markets work. And basically the system has been designed to implode. So for Obamacare to not completely implode, Republicans are already talking about getting rid of pre-existing conditions. What comes next? Um, the protections on young people, right? Most of you uh, can stay on your parents' insurance until you're 26 years old. That wasn't the case before Obamacare, right? Before Obamacare, the only way you could stay on your parents' insurance was if you were a full-time college student. But now, you know, if they get rid of those, uh, you know, those Obamacare provisions, this means that if you are unemployed, if this, uh, or if you are, you know, between jobs um, while you're young and just starting out your careers, well, right? That's a massive. That has a massive effect on you. I, I, let me just, you know, personal story. Uh, I was probably 24, 25, I had left one job, I was uh, working part-time in another job and doing an internship. I got food poisoning on Thanksgiving. 
and the only thing available to me was an emergency room. And my choice was, do I pay a $1,500 emergency room bill, or do I curl around the toilet and pray that the day ends, right? Like, that, that this, this passes. And the only option was to hug the toilet for the night, because $1,500 was not something that I could do. So it's something that, you know, even if it's not on your radar now, just know that this, this ACA is slowly being dismantled and it will disproportionately affect young people. Yeah, Trump actually even said he's, he is gonna get rid of the whole thing, including pre-existing conditions. Um, so, and he's been true to his word. You should take him seriously. <laughs> uh, another issue, and I know this is a, an abstract issue, so it might not have that kind of traction, um, and it wouldn't be something you would be putting on a ballot in any case, but it would definitely be something to think about, would be the environment. Um, it is going to very directly impact the hell out of you. Um, and then sort of a side one that's similar is the spiraling debt crisis. Um, Trump, by doing these tax cuts for the rich, has stacked on a bunch more debt onto, the, onto our debt. And at some point, it's going to become something we can't pay. And all the conventional economic models show it uh, that sometime around 2034, we are no longer going to be able to service the debt. At that point, we go bankrupt, and the United States going bankrupt will not be a pretty sight. So before 2034, well before 2034, we're going to have to start paying this debt off. Um, and uh, you know, I'm going to be getting close. I'm going to be closing in on retirement age by 2034. You're not. So this is going to impact younger people way more than it's going to impact older people. And and then of course there's the this uh, other and, and again this is even more abstract. It's going to hit direct it's going to affect you directly, but in a less obvious way. Every time we cut education spending, that means there's going to be fewer and fewer people who can run our extremely complicated, high-tech society. Like, at some point, we can't keep importing our MDs. Um, Asians are, what, 5.5% of the U.S. population, but they're 30% of our MDs. Uh, Muslims are 1.5% of our population, but they're 15% of our MDs. Right, and it's because we've been importing our MDs, our, our engineers, our computer scientists. They're not homegrown anymore. And so at some point, we're gonna have to make a decision, which is, are we gonna <laughs> return to producing our own intelligentsia that can, can run a high-tech society, or do we just let it sort of lose its competitive edge completely? Right, we've already lost most of our competitive edge, but there's still a piece left, there's still a core left. and. Uh, I think that's a problem. The other thing is, is that there are serious consequences to the rest of the world during this brain drain. Um, we, re we plunder the Philippines for RNs. I mean, we basically just treat the Philippines as this RN producing zone. That's how my mom got to come to the United <laughs> States, by the way, because she ha was an RN in the Philippines, and they were like, sure, you're like one of four professions that can just come on over. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it's great for the United States, because as a general, uh, my, my personal, my mom was an RN, my personal experience is that Filipino nurses are amazing, but it's terrible for the Philippines. It's actually catastrophic for the Philippines. They simply don't have the medical staff to, to handle their own problems. And you know, that, that has an impact on the globe. That means that the Philippines suffers. And I, I know you don't see that suffering indirectly, but it is actually impacting the quality of your life indirectly. If for no other reason, it incentivizes people to come here that you claim are taking away your jobs and you don't want here. Um, I don't think Bubba can be a brain surgeon. I don't think Muhammad took his job away. But uh, maybe we should fix that. Maybe we should give Bubba that education that he, he, he probably still won't be a brain surgeon. But we could try. <laughs> we could try. Yes. Where's the mic? If, if you ever don't <laughs> Sure. Who knows? <laughs> I think the two of us could talk forever about everything, so. Okay, so with my, where I'm from Houston, um, I just went back home for the weekend and I was surrounded by Ted Cruz rhetoric. Mm -hmm. And then I come back to Austin and I'm surrounded by Beto rhetoric everywhere. Um, but I feel like young, ki young voters are like, influenced all the time by their families, the people around them, but I see older voters just like with a solidified political belief, ideology, like they know what they want. How come 
younger voters, if they are more leaning, like more leaning, how, why and when does when do our beliefs solidify? Oh, that's a great question. So. Young voters and their political beliefs are believed to be the most malleable between the ages of like 15 and 25 or so, right? Because you were just, you know, in high school, that's really when your first introduction to politics truly is, right? Especially as you become, you know, 18 or so. Um, but it is during that point in your life where your views are most likely to diverge from your parents. Um, you know, there's this uh, sort of, there are two competing theories, and I shouldn't say they're competing theories, but there, there are a couple of different theories, and one uh, in particular is called generational theory. That you've got political generations that grow up with a particular you know, uh, political stamp or a political flavor to them. So you know, we, we can generally break down um, generations, like you know, baby boomers, Gen X, millennials, but even within the baby boomer generation, you can divide the older boomers from the younger boomers. The older boomers were the ones that were being drafted in Vietnam. I, I completely agree. How do we get young people to turn out? Draft everybody. <laughs> Piss everybody off. Um, but yeah, these young, I'm sorry, these older baby boomers who were the ones that were impacted by Vietnam, and they sort of were a little more pro-democratic than the generation before and after. Whereas if you looked at younger baby boomers, they tended to be a little more pro-Republican. Uh, and the same is true for the millennial generation. Older millennials who sort of came of political age, um, you know, during George W. Bush's administration, who were the hardest hit by that recession, who were the hardest hit by, you know, Afghanistan and Iraq, older millennials are probably among the most pro-democratic group in the electorate today. Younger millennials weren't as affected by those issues. So they are still a little left leaning, but not quite as much as older millennials are. When it comes to post millennials, I'm not really sure yet. So, but, but that's kind of how, um, you know, different generations might diverge from their parents a little bit more. It's just if there are these major political events, like a zeitgeist almost, that kind of like shakes up the political world right when you're turning about 18, 20 years old, that can significantly shift your political opinions so, so that they diverge from your parents. It's exactly what happened to me. Like, I use myself as a case study. My dad is a Hannity listening, Limbaugh watching, you know. Fox News is on at his house all the time. And he still thinks, even though I have a PhD in government, that he knows more than I do because he watches Fox News all day, right? I mean, talk about divergence in, um, in political beliefs. And that's just because my people my age were so uh, heavily impacted by that recession that, that it just changed. It changed us. Um, I'm not sure that anything's been politically impacting the post-millennial generation enough to actually drive them, you know, one way or the other. So, I don't know. We'll just have to wait and see as generations get older. That, that kind of answer your question, though? Like, 1825 really is the sweet spot for shifting opinions. But by 25, that's really when you sort of start locking in um, your political beliefs. And then there's, I, I mentioned there's this competing belief that it's called the life cycle effect. And the life cycle effect suggests that as you get older, you actually become a little more conservative as politics becomes more relevant, right? So you get you um, start earning more money, right? You get full-time jobs, but then you start getting higher paying jobs. Well, now I don't want to give the government as much of my money in taxes. Um, you start uh, having kids, and suddenly crime and law and order become very important to you. Um, you start purchasing homes, getting married, and you know all the tax benefits um, and, and these life experiences sort of trend towards conservatism, right? Plus, society evolves as well, right? So, you could get away with saying racist shit back in 1950 because it was socially acceptable. You can't do that now. But even, you know, when you look at, um, you know, uh, gender, I mean, 20 years ago, people were like, what's a gender spectrum? There, there's a gender spectrum now? So society evolves as well, and, and generations tend to sort of stay the same. It's kind of like music, right? Whatever music you listened to growing up, you kind of think that that generation's music is the best music. Right, um, and that the kids today are listening to crap. Um, it's similar with regards to you know the, these life cycle effects. Society sort of evolves around you, and maybe you sort of get stuck. And because you get stuck, 
progress happens, and you become more and more conservative, even if you think you're a liberal when you're young. Yeah, there's also the possibility, and it happens occasionally, uh, where adults will have a mass ideological shift. Uh, so Walter Dean Burnham talked about this, um, where uh, you, right, think of the 30s, all of a sudden a bunch of people became liberal in the, in the aftermath of the Great Depression. The, there was a, the swing the other direction, which was the 80s and 90s, where, where being conservative became this new thing and a lot of people became conservative, including like you were saying, like the younger baby boomers becoming yuppies. And, mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's not necessarily that you become you become fixed after a certain point of development, because uh, there could be a, a change that happens. But they tend to happen as a group, like a whole group of people will swing in one direction or another. And I think what drives that is a combination of crises, so you can think of the Great Depression or, or war like the Vietnam War, but there's also something else, um, and that is the need to have meaning in, our, in your life. And I, I think this is actually where we, get, we can get into a little bit of a danger zone. So, you know, traditionally speaking, when you, if you were to go back before we started doing popular elections, so put us somewhere in the early 1700s, um, the way you generated meaning in your life was you looked to the king, what the king was doing, you looked to your religion, you looked to the history of your, your culture, your society, you looked to the traditions of your society, and you looked to your family. And those were the mechanisms for generating meaning. Now, the family unit smashed to pieces because we move all the time. We don't keep in touch except through Facebook, which is pretty, pretty unrewarding. And, um, and then, you know, people aren't as religious as we used to be. And nobody knows any history because we went to public school in Texas. So we don't know anything, actually, not just history. So we don't even know science uh, or math. And then, um, and then on top of it all, uh, the, the, our, our culture really hasn't done a great job of producing meaningful art outside of Netflix miniseries, right? I mean, they, they, we really have sort of dropped the ball at some level. I mean, we, we, the TV is great, but kind of after that, it's not, it's not that amazing. And I, and I think what's happened is we're in a period where people are looking to politics to generate meaning in their lives. And that's super dangerous because, it, because once you claim your political identity and you say, this is what's going to get me meaning in my life, it means you can't hear what anybody else is saying. Because anything that contradicts then your bubble of ideas is, is actually questioning your meaning, the meaning that you get in your life. So you automatically have to take it personally. There's no way you can separate that out. It would be the equivalent of, of questioning your religion, right, at that point. And, and we don't, I, this is a problem. We don't want politics to have the same value as religion because I want to be able to point out to you you're wrong for the following reasons. And I think we've lost that ability. And, and so it's true that you, know, you guys are maybe a little bit more malleable and you're figuring things out, but I think your goal is to always remain malleable and always figuring things out. Like when you turn 25, don't, don't go, this is it. I'm done, I figured this out. Uh, keep, keep asking these hard questions and don't, don't accept answers. And then of course parents have this huge role, but, but you can also rebel against them. So it's, it's not necessarily that you're going to follow in that path. Oh, and I guess, too, when you get older, you want comfort, right? So you think about what made you comfortable as a child. Like, people were surveyed what the most ideal time period in U.S. history was, and they're all saying the 50s. <laughs> and you're like, how did you get there? You're watching Happy Days or something? Are you, <laughs> what, what was, <laughs> and of course, the 70s were so terrible that we, were, we had our sitcoms all set in the, in the 50s, so we could reminisce this much better time period. <laughs> Anyway, there's a question over there. So going off what y'all have said is I kind of think that ideology comes from life experiences, obviously. But I don't, everyone's not able to have certain life experiences. Like some people just have the same steady thing throughout their whole lives. Do you think that um, funding more younger education, like to keep would increase more malleable minds, like to keep them more truth-seeking rather than like comfort zone. Like if you do it at more of like a younger level. I don't know how you teach that though. I didn't know if y'all had any experience in even younger minds than us. Cause I think a lot of times like, I don't, besides coming to college, I didn't know anything like about politics, like parents were Republican. 
And then I had life experiences and I'm like, more Democrat. But if Wood increased funding in younger people, like even younger than us, right. help the more malleable minds or not? So you're, are you talking about like increasing civic education funding for high schoolers, you mean, or like? Yeah, kind of, and just education that? in general to like learn about other cultures and different. Yeah. Well, I mean, it'd be great in an ideal world, right? It would be great because you all are supposed to have high school government classes. You're all supposed to be introduced to politics, even at the elementary school level, right? This is the president, right? It goes back to the state of public education in Texas. I mean, I know that for most of you, right, who were educated in Texas, your high school government teacher was probably a coach, maybe yeah. track coach, <laughs> maybe coach, right? Probably watched movies for most of your government classes. So, yes, yeah, you smile, right? I, I'm assuming this happened. I had a student who said she watched Braveheart four times in one semester. So I'm just like, really? <laughs> How is that even related? But <laughs> sure. Um, so ideally, right, it, it would be great to get, um, you know, students or, or young people's feet wet with politics earlier. But when it comes to the state's priorities, right, math, English, science, these standardized tests all take precedence, right? And all of this education money is, is being poured towards those specific subjects that are being tested. Here's an idea. Maybe, it, it, maybe if we make a standardized test for civics and we'll actually, you know, get more attention when it comes to government politics. I think, I mean, I'll always say yes to more funding of schools. Um, I, I think one of, the one, of the, one of the things that drives me nuts is how bad some of y'all are at writing and reading. And like, I wouldn't mind seeing that improved. I think that'd be even a, a great start. Just because if you if you were better at those skill sets, you'd right, you'd be you'd be more prepared uh, to go after the information yourself. Um, I I'm actually fascinated with the idea of the the impact of life experiences. So I think one of the problems that we have with the way we set up our culture is you know we want our children to be in a bubble where everything is bubble wrapped and safe and careful and there's no travel because that's dangerous and there's no exposure to other cultures, there's no exposure to experiences and I think that's the biggest limiting thing in, in a person's development. Um, I was just reading this article where this tea partier, so he was a politician who, you know, right in the beginning, it was 2009, he's, he joins the tea party movement, he runs for office in 2010, he wins office and he's one of those, let's lock them all up and let God sort them out kind of tea partiers. And he gets busted. And I don't remember what he had done, but he, he did something he wasn't supposed to with some money somewhere. And he ends up going to prison. Then he comes out of prison and he's like, we need to do prison reform. I, uh, pr people in prison are just wonderful people who made mistakes in their lives. You know, like, what happened to you in prison? You were only there for two years. And the answer is, he saw the world. He saw a piece of the world that he hadn't seen before. And I, so I actually think one of the things that we should think about doing is, is you know, forces to travel. So, uh, when we draft you, we're going to deploy you overseas <laughs> and make you experience some of the rest of the world. Uh, in, in part, for just because I think it changes your perspective. I think being in another country, being exposed to different cultures, and, and so I guess the, the thing I, you could do is even if we didn't spend the money on public school education, because we have these other priorities like military, um, what we could do as individuals is we could we could make the effort to make sure our children were we're being exposed to the world and not so bubble wrapped and, and coddled. Uh, I, I think you end up with really terrible adults when you, when you do that. Um, and then the other thing that I think is just bewildering is there, and it's the civics thing, why, why so this is a democracy, it's obviously not, but we pretend anyway. So supposedly the citizenry is, you know, if the, if the United States is a car, the citizenry uh, is the drivers by voting and yet you know nothing about how the thing works. So you're like driving a car and you don't know which pedal to press because you don't know what the pedals do and you don't know what a steering wheel is. And you know, you jumped into the car and it was already moving and somehow you're supposed to not have a car accident. And then we have 
terrible election result after terrible election result, and it's clearly Geigo. It's garbage in, garbage out. And th so at that level, the politicians look like they're irresponsible on purpose. They want you to not be properly educated so that you don't know how to drive this vehicle so that they can manage it for you. Um, I mean, that's too bad. Yeah. 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 One more? Yeah. Okay. okay. I had a quick question. Oh, two uh, more. Oh, let's do more. <laughs> what is the best way or the most efficient way to get out the vote for people our age? How do we help influence that? You look somebody in the eye and say, can I count on you to vote? Right? Can I count on you to show up on election day? Um, in-person canvassing, right, knocking on people's doors, asking for their support is the single best way to mobilize anybody to the polls. Right? So hold your friends accountable. On election day, look them in the face and say, have you turned out to the polls yet? Have you cast your vote yet? If not, get in the car, we're going to the polls, right? Get in, loser, we're going to the polls. So yeah, I, I mean, it, it, this is actually what uh, made the Obama campaign in 2008 so successful, because instead of just you know, relying on social media, instead of relying on TV ads, he had so many boots on the ground knocking on doors in some of these major battleground states, right? And, and this is where, you know, Beto actually has a shot too. Yeah. I mean, he's making this, this college tour, right? I mean, he started here at ACC. He's gone to most of the major universities in our state. And he's, you know, asking people, do, not only should you cast a vote, but make sure your friends show up too, right? That social pressure is a big deal. You know, when you go on, it, it, even when you log on to Facebook, on November 6th, right? And that button says, I voted, make sure you click that. Because if your friends see, oh, you, you know, I have 200 friends who voted, well, maybe that's something I should do too, right? Social pressure, and straight up just ask them, right? Because that way they have a buy-in in the election now. And it's also to the point where the canvassers will, will even stop at a place that, a house that has yard signs up. Because it's not enough that the person has the art signs up. You know, you, you constantly want to keep pushing. You know the person's going to vote, but eh, it doesn't hurt to right. come, give them a little bit of a nudge. You're there. You're already right. on the ground. So I think uh, the persistence is also really important. It is really important. And you know, like, even something like the weather affects turnout on election day, yes. right? Sometimes if it's too rainy, people are like, well, other people are going to vote, so it's fine, right? Well, no. Like, make sure you go vote and make sure other people do too. Um, how do you help the community? Set up a, a carpool or a van pool, right? So that you can make sure that people don't, who don't have access to transportation can get to the polls. Um, you know, uh, set up Facebook groups for this, whatever. But whatever you do, just make sure, because this is what I found among young people. Even though young people just have, you know, still have these political preferences, it's a lot easier to just stay home and watch Netflix and eat Funyuns on election day, right? And a lot of them do, most do. So one of the things too, I was nervous the first time I voted. Like I was nervous before going, I had anxiety about going. Uh, you know, when, especially when you're young, you feel weird in social situations that you've never been in before. And I think that we discount that. We pretend like that's not there. We pretend like you should just get over it. Um, at the end of the day, you should just get over it, but it, I think we should talk about it. Like, I, it is normal to feel that kind of anxiety. It is normal to, to not be sure about things. It, and, and, and to, you know, how will I make the machine work? Do I know how to make this work? Because we don't, we're not taught that because Coach, the 350-pound donut eating machine, taught us government in our 420 year, where we had two sections of PE and then economics and government, and we weren't even going to class. And when we were, we were watching Braveheart. And so, uh, or his high school football career videos. And so, uh, you know what I mean. So, uh, that's sad. Um, so I, I think, accept it, acknowledge that it, it made you nervous, that you had a little bit of anxiety, and then, and then maybe talk to your friends about it, and maybe go as a group. Turn it into a fun event. I, 140 years ago, American politics were corrupt. We didn't have the Australian ballot. Bosses would tell their employees, you know, you need to vote this way, and then they go check it up to make sure they did, and when they didn't, they got fired. But we had 70% voter turnout. 
in presidential election years instead of 55% voter turnout. Like we, and the, one of the reasons was is voters made it into a party. They actually went out together as a group and they went and they voted and they turned it into a fun event where it was a chance to socialize. I, I, we used, the Democratic Party in Texas used to have a caucus. We stopped now. 2016, we didn't do it. Well, that's tragedy because the caucus was sort of a way to turn voting into kind of a party. You got together and you met your neighbors that you'd never talked to before. And you could, you know, talk about politics, talk about where you were in the world. And I, and I think if you could do that, you could make it into something more like that, I think it would make life better. The voting shouldn't be a drudgery, it shouldn't be a chore, it should be something that you get excited about that you can't wait to go do. Um, and it's not, and that's, that's a mistake. Yeah, and something else that's actually really fun too, especially if you live here in Austin, um, start conversations with people in line. Uh, that oh helps my the God, time every pass, time. And it's so interesting. It's, it's always rewarding. Yeah, it really is. But you know, you, you mentioned how, like, especially when you're, you're voting for the first time, you're a little nervous. Even adults who have voted multiple times still feel that way because you're just like, oh crap, like, what do I need? Do I need my ID? Like, you know, and especially the, the ID. Right? And, and the process is different. I, I mean, my process is different. I mean, like, you know, you go to a new polling place, um, how they have it set up, how many machines they have, it all, it all differs. So, um, how long is the line going to yeah, be? Yeah, how long is the line going to be? By the way, go to the Travis County website, and it'll tell you how long all the lines are at the various polling stations in Austin. So, you know, in uh, 2016, my husband went to a very popular polling place. And he's like, yeah, he called me, and he's like, yeah, I'm going to be here for about an hour. I went on the Travis County website and I'm like, there's literally a polling place two, two we, uh, blocks away from you that has a 10 to 15 minute wait. He got in his car, drove over, and was still out. Um, he, he finished voting and was out of there before he would have even gotten through the line at the first place. So use these tools. May, you know, they're available to you, just people aren't aware of them. And I ran into a student when I was voting on Friday. Fun. That was fun. Yeah. Yeah. So he gets X credit. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, was there another question down here? So my, my question is both of you guys. I mean, we start our conversation that the world is going for the right, mm -hmm. as a politically right, and then the, the battle is um, Republican, it's a left side. So what is the reason the people vote for the battle or do you think what will happen to surprising that the crews win, I mean, because nobody uh, expecting the, the, the Trump was going to president, but it's happened, mm -hmm. sadly. So what is the, what is the search is saying? What is the research? What is the, um, the, the result, the numbers is saying? And then any prediction? What do, you, what do you guys thinking about? So is your question that, like, why is the world sort of... No, my, okay. my question is, so the right now is the politically every country is going to the right side. Mm -hmm. So and then how do you think the battle is going to win in this, right now, in this time, because it's on the left side? Don't you think it's kind of weird? Uh, well, I mean, I think both of our predictions was that Beto was probably going to lose. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I just don't yeah. think that there's enough voter turnout amongst young people and, and Hispanics mm -hmm. to, to swing it for Beto. Yeah. Um, but, so it's like the weather, right? Um, or it's like global warming. One of the fun things about global warming has been that we've been, we've been experiencing colder and colder winters. So generally speaking, the Earth's temperatures are increasing. So when you average them out, the summers are so much hotter than they used to be that even though we're having colder winters than we used to, it averages out to the temperature has increased. So it, it, I, you should see pockets of people flying to the left and, po and, and people winning as leftists even as the world is going to the right, in part because you're going to see the population in the middle polarizing. And, and as a result, you could see these types of elections where, in, even in a country like the United States, which is pretty far to the right right now, um, where, where, where there are wins. Having said that, also in the United States, more people oppose the direction we're going in than, than support the direction we're going in. The, the question is, how do you get them to go vote? Um, and then, and then 
in the case of Beto, whether he wins or not, this could be the pendulum coming back the other direction. But we, we, one of the things that's always interesting about these types of movements in the world is, you know, they keep going, they keep going, they keep going, and then they come back. And so we don't know where that point of comeback is. Um, so I don't think you should focus too much on the, the overall trend, even though you should probably know what the overall trend is. You, you, should, you need to, at the end of, end of the day, realize right here, right now is where the fight is. And, and don't, don't get lost in the fact that state after state is going neo-Nazi or, <laughs> I mean. So don't worry about the neo-Nazis. Don't worry about the neo-Nazis, <laughs> but remember to, to keep fighting, like don't get, I, I, I fear that one of the problems is you can get depressed too easy, right? And then you just go, well, what's the point anymore? Right. You lose your political efficacy and say, say, well, it doesn't matter. Well, it does matter, right? I mean, you, uh, the, the whole point of this migrant caravan from Honduras, right, was safety in numbers. And we should actually be, you know, applying that to our political environment as well. There's safety in numbers, right? Uh, if you stay at home and don't join the group, nothing's going to change, right? But if you get people together and everybody actually comes out, you can make a difference. You can affect political change. So, yeah, don't lose that sense of efficacy because you do matter, right? Your input does matter. And, and having said that, there has been there have been some really interesting surprises this year in the primaries, um, like Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, for example, is one of those where she took out the number two Democrat in the House, and you know she's it looks like she's going to go from bartender to representative <laughs> pretty much overnight, um, and th those types of they're shocks to the system and they're really surprising, but they're also they also show you sort of the power of being the right person at the right time and having uh, a population of people who are open to your message. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think sometimes being in Texas, we forget that. I, I, I think it's also worth pointing out, and I, I did, but I, I'll repeat it, you know, Wendy Davis lost by 20 points, Clinton lost by nine points, Beto might lose by four points, that Texas is heading towards the left. So even if the world trend is going to the right, Texas is going the other direction. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that we have a very young population, right? We have a very large Latino population, both of both gr groups of which have sort of been the Republican, I'm sorry, in the Democratic constituency. Problem is, they just don't act on their political beliefs as often. Um, I, I tell my students that the biggest mistake I think that the Hillary Clinton uh, campaign made was not choosing Julian Castro as her running mate. Julian Castro, former mayor of San Antonio, um, you know, he opened uh, the Democratic National Convention in 2012, was it, for Obama? I don't remember. I don't remember either. But, you know, he was, you know, this force to sort of be reckoned with. He was the... Um, Secretary of uh, Housing and Urban Development for the Obama administration for a while. And I think had he been on the ticket, it would have energized the Latino vote. I think he's young enough also. He's, he, he's a great charismatic speaker, very similar to Obama. And I think that he would have also excited young people. So my dream candidate for 2020 is Julian Castro. I think that, um, yeah, for the pendulum to sort of swing back to the left, you need that charismatic you know, force to uh, that, that individual who's really going to sort of inspire people. And I think that's him. I think that's him right now. With a strong running mate like Kamala Harris, uh, the senator from um, California. She's half black, half Indian? That sounds right, right? So, I mean, you've got, like, good demographics. It, that's my dream ticket, Julian Castro and Kamala Harris, right? That's how Democrats take back the country. <laughs> Also, it's worth picking on Asians a little bit because Asians also have terribly low turnout. But at 5.5% of the national, I think, we're, I think Asians are 6% of Texas, um, that, that, that's an important swing vote. So if, if Asians can also be brought out, that would be really an, an important move. Yeah, too. the problem with Asians, though, is that a lot of Asian Americans aren't actually American. A lot of them don't get their citizenship. Um, so where the, the, the tide really has to turn is among second generation Asian sure. Americans. And right now, you know, I, I think for the Asian American community, it's, it's less 
you know, that some are Republican, some are Democrats. I think for the Asian communities, it's more based on location, right? Like Southern California Asians tend to be pretty economically conservative, but fairly socially liberal, right? But that's different from like Asian Americans outside of Houston and like Sugarland and stuff. So yeah, the Asian community is, is, is very hard to predict. All right, we good? <laughs> okay, one more. Is, it, is this about Bolsonaro? <laughs> In general. In general. Um, uh, my question is, like, we talked a lot about um, how to convince the young people to come out. <laughs> how do you convince older people that we actually have big issues coming, and if we don't start to kind of fix our world mm -hmm. in 10 years, like, um, like we saw now, the UN showing that in 12 years we could actually be in, uh, in trouble. Mm -hmm. So like how do you get to convince older people that we actually need to make choices thinking about the common good and the future? So I've given up on older people and I think we should. <laughs> I didn't want to say it, but. <laughs> I think we should actually take away the right to vote. <laughs> well, I wasn't going to go that far. But, you know, when it comes to politics, right, very few people think long term, right? It's really hard unless there's that personal connection, right? So how do you get grandma or grandpa to um, consider global warming a problem? Make it personal, right? Look them in the eyes and say, you do realize that the world may not exist by the time I reach your age, right? That, that global warming may have, you know, catastrophic, you know, and so many of them don't even understand what global warming is at this point, right? So, so I, I think it, it would take more of a personal connection. How does this impact you? It impacts you because I am special to you, and these issues impact me, right? Um, why don't, you know, Social Security and Medicare are, the two biggest budget items in our government, right, our federal government, and yet politicians are terrified to touch these programs, to reform them, even though they're in dire need of reform. Why? Because old people vote, right? And so, uh, and older people are like, you know, especially like, you know, people in their 40s, 50s, were thinking about retirement, they're like, oh, hell no, I, I don't want to reform Social Security and Medicare because I want to retire at 66 and be able to get full benefits. I don't want the, vote, the, the, the age to raise to 70, right? So very myopic, you know, not looking to, towards future generations, even though we're the ones that are gonna be saddled with these massive amounts of debt. So yeah, my, my only suggestion is make it personal, right? How, uh, ask them how it impacts them. Well, it impacts the people that they care about the most. Having said that, and I think that's, that's very reasonable, you, you should know that you're gonna run into the I'm older than you thing, which yep. is infuriating. Um, and I, you know, as a result, I know better because I've had all these life experiences. And I, I think you have to just set your sights low. Mm -hmm. like, don't expect anything. And then maybe try to personalize it. Like, geez, look, look at what this is going to do to my life. Mm -hmm. uh, not having a Houston that I can go to from time to time is going to make me sad, <laughs> right? And, uh, <laughs> And, and then just hope that gets through to them. I, and then maybe uh, slash their tires on election yeah, day. Yeah. Yeah. Something. Uh, hide their wheelchair. Hide their wheelchair <laughs> on election day. Yeah. But remind them that if something isn't done about Social Security, they're going to have to live in your basement mm -hmm. when, they can't, when they can't afford to live on their own anymore. Remind them election day is November 7th. Remind them of nursing homes. <laughs> I really like the November 7th thing. But, but nursing homes. <laughs> anyway, I'm being really mean, but... I, no, but it's hard, right? It I mean, it is really hard to change the minds of older voters. And I, and I think it really does boil down to this, I'm getting my meaning from this thing. And it's like, no, politics is about resource distribution. It is not about meaning generation. That's why we have uh, places of worshipping imaginary friends. And on that note, <laughs> do, do we want to end it on a different note? I, I'm open to that. <laughs> I go to the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monsters. Okay, yeah. so there you have it. She's on the record.
All right, thanks for coming out. And remember to vote. Oh my gosh, and get your friends to vote. Get your friends to vote, more important. Hey, or do like the Russians do, and get them in a bus and take them on a tour from voting place to voting place <gasps> to voting place. Ooh, like it's a, like a boo, <laughs> not a booze cruise, but what is it, what are they called, party buses? Get a party bus, say, yeah. hey, we're gonna drink some booze, go vote, make a party of it. <laughs> do it. Yes. Oh, we didn't make one, but you can make one. All right, thanks for coming out. Thanks for coming out.